Live and let live. Paul spends too much time with a deer to pull the trigger. It feels like now I know him. <laughs> While much of the media is trumping up wildlife crime charges against imaginary gamekeepers, we meet some real ones who are giving wildlife a helping hand during the breeding season. We're giving away a custom Wooks rifle stock priced at more than £500. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Is there a difference between hunting and killing? Have you entered? Drove a long way. <laughs> um, <sighs> we'll come back to that in a bit. Let's start by meeting the Lewises. This is James and his daughter Ruby. Both are super keen deer stalkers. The reason is Ruby's grandfather. They are showing Paul around the grounds surrounding his cottage deep in a Wiltshire wood. Very special for me because my granddad, for sure. If mum and dad went out or something, you know, babysitter would be granddad. <laughs> so, you know, in the passenger seat of the Land Rover, go around the woods. I think it's very special purely because of him. Obviously, the apple not falling far from the tree then with young Ruby. Quad bikes, driving the truck, tractor, uh, everything possible. Um, and all the guns and things she's just taken to them um, and really enjoys it, which is great for me. Ruby and James invited Paul to come stalking after Ruby shot a Chinese water deer with Mr Childerley. She recently completed the Game and Wildlife course at Sparshot College and she is looking for work. It is a difficult time for youngsters looking for jobs in the shooting community. You're probably a good barometer of what the market's like at the moment. I imagine it's pretty tough. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult at the minute, for sure. Um, if it wasn't difficult enough, like being a lady in the industry as well, it's, it makes it even more of a challenge, but I feel like I've, I'm going to do all right if I just keep proving them wrong, sort of thing. Do you think there are barriers for someone like yourself? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you can have everything on paper, but as soon as they see you're a girl, sometimes you're automatically out, which is a bit of a shame. Ruby was the only female student on the course. She also feels that being a woman makes life that little bit tougher in the professional shooting world. For a young person going into this, are you sort of seeing the frustrations that maybe there are for, for someone like her? Yeah, it's a little bit harder for Ruby to get into it, um, but she's great at what she does and, and perseveres and everything, um, whether it's clay shooting or rifle shooting with the deer and she's really capable of what, you know, all the aspects of it. Before we head off stalking, David asks her one of the most controversial questions a deer manager is faced with. What's your favourite venison? Best tasting venison? Oh, for sure. Bloody hell, Muntjac. Really? For sure, for sure. What? Muntjac saddle. It's wicked, on the barbecue. Yeah, salt and pepper, oh, a bit of oil. Gone off you. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Muntjac. Really? Mm. I, I definitely think so. Blown it. Time to go stalking. And to start with, Paul has the run of the place. <laughs> no, take your chances. Yeah. Um, okay. Sticks. Yep. Okay. Um, and yeah, if there's a nice opportunity in there, then take it. Yeah, okay. Yep. Brilliant no job. problem with that. Okay. Um, and also with the monk jack. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But are you sure you want a monk jack shot? It's your call. Okay. I mean, if you've shot enough in your time in it and yeah. you're not that bothered, then yeah. you, yeah. if you see something nice and you fancy it, then, yeah. then take it. Okay. So when your dad first moved here, Muntjac was a, very an rare. alien species. Yeah, very rare. Yeah, same as the fallow. We didn't have the fallow here until the early 90s either um, in this block. But always nice robots. Yeah. Um, see, see there, see there, James, right? So me and you have been stood here for 10 minutes whispering, going on. David comes into the picture no, no, no. and like, rah, 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 rah. That's a good question, David, but like, you know, we want to shoot one. I've got headphones on, sorry. <laughs> it's like with the, with the deaf granddad at the end of the table, suddenly <laughs> after the salt. And it's a... <laughs> We're far enough away. Oh, that's right. <laughs> sorry, David. Apologize. Yeah. I'm actually blushed. <laughs> and not a lot of wind. Yeah. It looks like the wind's gently this way, so yeah. I think it's the right yeah. way to go. Yeah. 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 yeah, great stuff. Let's see what happens. Great, I'll grab a stick somewhere. Okay. I can move. Okay. 
With David switching to stealth mode, he and Paul head off. Within a few minutes, the muntjac are barking and Paul faces a dilemma. There's no shot on this little roebuck. Then other thought processes come into play and we return to the difference between hunting and killing. Have you now got too much of a connection with him to shoot him? Yes, basically, yeah. It feels like now I know him. Calling <laughs> <laughs> that really easily. <laughs> no, he's safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I don't have to shoot more. It's quite really funny, really. I call it seeing them. And it is about, for me, it is about the, it is about the hunt and it is about the management. So James said to me, right, we need those youngsters shot. We need those four youngsters shot from here in this week. Then I would have just gone here, yep, yeah, it's a bit, bosh, take it. And it had been like, yeah, got it, got the first one off the list. Um, but as he said, you know, go through there, shoot what gives you pleasure, you know, we don't need to shoot more, we can shoot what we need to shoot. So, it's a young buck. He's not hurting anyone, he's in a mature woodland. Um, I'm sure there's some out on the edges where there's some like, young trees or some, some crops. So, you know, we'll let him run. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got some. Yeah. He's a bit daft, right? Totally dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Survival of the thickest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very dumb. Our little buck lives to fight another day. It's weird how some animals, sitting right there in the crosshairs, we let walk by. Armchair psychologists, please go for it in the comments. Three down there, and then there's one up there. There's a roebuck on the right. Was he? Yeah, young, young buck. Oh, right. And, uh, I mean, he was just so nice on you, David. Mm -hmm. he's a, well, I'm he, glad you saw one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah he's good. And there's another bank. I went for a pee in the edge there, and a man and a jack was barking at me. Really? <laughs> Everywhere. I see a lot of track. Yeah, a lot a of lot, track. Yeah. A lot of yeah. yeah. But this time, I say, this time is difficult. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So much cover, yeah. That no, was good. Plan B, and we're going to explore another block of woodland with Ruby guiding. There are deer, but there's also a lot of cover. The only species on show are the fallow. Maybe we should have taken that little row after all. So deer. Yes, yeah, so lots of deer. See a group of fallow, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, just nothing we need. But it's like it's so thick. The bracken's like up here, and yeah, we've left it a little bit. No, what it was, we went to come three, four weeks ago and David couldn't come. That's a lie, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> lie. I couldn't come. And then... And then we could have had the blue bears. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Open. Yeah, birds singing. Yeah, that's it. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> the screen's now green, we can't see your tan. Oh, okay. here we go. <laughs> Picking on me again. Beautiful field. A career in shooting is hard work and right now ah. opportunities are few and far between. Out of all the gamekeeper disciplines, deer management is surely an area of growth and where we need to see more young people of both sexes studying game and wildlife management and playing a greater role in the future of field sports. So what's, what's the next plans for you then? Are you going to Germany, is it? Yes, Germany. Germany on the 15th, so that'd be good fun. Go yeah. see some friends, sit up high seat and uh, yeah. On board. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, ball. Um, so that'll be good fun. Maybe a row back if it comes out or whatever. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, really looking forward to it. It'll be a well, nice little getaway. Cool. Well, good luck and uh, thanks for today. And Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll see you again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cheers. Brilliant job. <laughs> for more information about Paul's Sacco S20 with the camo stock, go to sacco.fi. Thank you, Paul and Ruby. Now, from let it go to our very own Princess from Frozen. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Experts have criticised a report into game bird releasing by controversial scientist Stephen Harris. 
the Labour Animal Welfare Party Society commissioned the research which is critical of shooting sports. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust says the report is not a scientific review, even though it is presented as one. GWCT experts say Harris's evidence on fox numbers, dispersal of game birds and the ecological effects of releasing them are inaccurate. Harris, a retired Bristol University academic, has previously been accused of manipulating evidence in court in favour of an animal rights agenda. Dr Rufus Sage leads the team from GWCT examining the Harris report. Papers uh, were being referred to in the report um, selectively and not accurately and there were several papers that were, I'm going to use the word misrepresented in there. So they they, according to the Laws report by Professor Harris, um, the papers were sh showing things that actually were not shown by those papers. A new government strategy recommends wild venison as an alternative to beef. Prime Minister Boris Johnson launched DEFRA's new food plan from a farm in Cornwall. It commits £270 million for a farming innovation funding programme, with some reports saying that deer stalkers could benefit from the cash. Derbyshire Dales District Council has defended itself against claims that it's committed vandalism. BBC TV presenter Chris Packham criticised the council for mowing a patch of grass. He reacted to a social media post of the land near a leisure centre in Matlock. Packham wrote, we are all getting sick of excuses for this sort of vandalism. The council issued a response saying the space is not preserved for wildlife and is mowed regularly. It said the land had delayed the mowing because of the No Mow May campaign. The Welsh Government has quashed claims that country sports will be banned by 2024. Basque took action after a series of claims posted on social media. The post said shooting and other country sports would have no future in Wales. Basque received a letter from Julie James, the Welsh Minister for Climate Change, denying the reports. She says the posts were inaccurate and the claims are baseless. Basque Wales director Steve Griffiths says he is still concerned that the Welsh Government shows limited support for shooting. The Game Fair has announced it will present long service awards to gamekeepers at the Festival of the Countryside at the end of July. These honours are not the same as the long service awards given to gamekeepers by the National Gamekeepers Organisation. The NGO took over the awards from the Country Land and Business Association in 2015. The CLA handed them over when it ceased to run the annual Game Fair. The NGO took to social media to say the new awards have caused confusion and they weren't aware of the plans until they were posted online. Uh, it's the National Gamekeepers Organisation that are uh, awarding the Long Sand in a uh, Long Service Award. What the Game Fair are awarding now, we're not quite sure, but it can't be the Long Standing Award. Farmers and crofters in Scotland can claim financial compensation to stem losses from sea eagle predation. The birds are causing havoc during lambing. Nature Scott is running the scheme for the National Sea Eagle Stakeholder Panel. It's inviting anyone who has suffered losses to apply for help. Farmers will need to log details of the lamb losses and provide evidence of incidents of livestock predation related to sea eagles. The Scottish Countryside Alliance says it is essential the government compensates people who have suffered losses from the introduction of the birds. On the whole, this was a government scheme. Um, there's a reintroduction plan and because of that, farmers, crofters and landowners are suffering. A private rhino breeder in South Africa has announced plans to release 100 white rhinos into the wild every year. John Hume runs the world's largest rhino farm in the northwest province of the country. He has a herd of more than 2,000 rhinos. His company, Platinum Rhino, says the deal to release the animals to their natural habitats is ready for implementation. No date has been set for the rollout. Around 80% of the world's rhino population are in South Africa. Most are on private ranches, while poaching is rife in national parks. Thank you to Richard Walton for the story. Zimbabwe has announced that communities will receive 100% of the money generated by international hunting revenues. Under the management programme known as Campfire, the money was paid to rural district councils that later distributed it. Communities only received 60% of the cash under the scheme that was introduced in 1989. Zimbabwe is also in the spotlight for its bid to sell live elephants and ivory. The country invited 16 African countries to join its cause. Only five countries signed up, 
which means there isn't a continent-wide consensus, so it won't be taken to the CITES meeting in Panama in November. A Land Rover Defender, first driven by the late Prince Philip, is up for auction. The Duke of Edinburgh was such a fan of the Landys, he designed a custom Defender 130 gun bus for his funeral. The Collecting Cars website is selling the iconic Defender sports model that was sent to the palace for Prince Philip in 2010. The Keswick green paintwork is in great condition and with just over 15,000 miles on the clock, it could prove a right royal bargain. The auction ends on Friday the 17th of June 2022. Staying with the royal theme and shooting artist Eleanor Tomlinson has created an image of the Queen and Paddington Bear. During the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, thousands of people contacted her asking for copies of the sketch of the Queen holding Paddington's hand. Ellen is well known for the artwork of the countryside, especially game birds and horses. The Yorkshire artist has recruited her family to cope with more than 25,000 emails asking about the watercolour. The original was sold to a regular customer. Eleanor is now working hard to make copies for her new fans. Feeding birds in St Mark's Square is an iconic tourist pastime, but the pandemic has attracted a new visitor. The lack of tourism led to clearer canal waters, which has meant more fish, and that, says officials, is why gulls are flocking to the Italian city to eat them. The birds are now becoming aggressive and taking food from people's plates and hands too. Some hotels in Venice are arming their guests with orange water pistols to scare them off. The birds are protected. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. And finally, there's a video doing the rounds of a roebuck having a go at a ram. The sheep is tethered, an advantage for the deer uses in the fight, though the buck gets his antlers tangled in the rope. Eventually, a man and his dog step in to break up the fight. Even then, the buck is not keen to run away until the dog encourages it. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Next up, a word from ATN. Staying on young people starting out in hunting, let's divert to South Africa for more from the Northern Cape Professional Hunting School. Ollie Williams is out with trainee professional hunters from the school after, he hopes, a wildebeest. We met up with the, with the young PHs who were, who were, who were studying here um, and we basically were out for whatever we could find that would be suitable for the cull. We first looked at a couple of red hartebeests but they, 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 they suspected us early and, and moved off and then we saw a Nice pair of um, blue wildebeest, about um, half a mile away. I mean, it's stalking paradise. You've got amazing topography and bushes you can use as cover in ravines and rivers, and it really is. It's um, it is a paradise here for, for hunting. Two good bulls, one of them which was definitely good for a cull. Um, so we started to make our way in, plan a bit of a stalk, and we found a really nice row of um, row of bushes which which we thought would work really well for a stalk. Um, we were hopping between one, hopping between one, until we, we reached the end of these bushes uh, and found uh, that we were probably about 160 yards away. We probably could have got closer, and I, I would, if I had been PHing, I probably would have liked to have got closer. But um, I was happy to take the shot, so I took the shot. And for my for all intents and purposes, I'd say it was perfect, you know, straight in the middle of the shoulder. Uh, both the PHs agreed, uh, but the, it, it was ran certainly mortally wounded, but a lot further than a mortally wounded animal should run. I mean, they do call these things the poor man's buffalo because wildebeest are tough as nails. Um, and then I shot it again and he, he went down for good this time. But it was remarkable to see this, you know, this animal go for as long as it did. Um, and we, when we got there, confirmed was the first shot was perfect. Um, straight in the middle of the shoulder, you know, right through the... It was probably a bit higher the heart because the wildebeest's heart is quite low, uh, low down the leg. Um, but you know, straight for the straight for the lungs and, and God knows what else. Basically, stuff that you shouldn't be able to run away from. 
but he did. Ollie did part of the PH course here back in 2019, so he knows some of what the young PHs looking after him are going through. Yeah, there was definitely there's definitely more buffalo here now. There's more, all, all pretty much all the planes came. Um, the only thing they struggled with, I think, is the is the zebra, uh, but that's probably because they've had um, leopard that have that have that made their way in. So, you know, the leopard are an example of where the, ec- the ecosystem is strong enough now to support the big predators. Um, so I think they're absolutely over the moon to see the leopard here, and um, it's another testament to, to what to what the hard work of these these PHs has, has done and done for the area. So your PH is is your eyes and ears all of the time if you're a client you you, you know you do what they say and, and mainly because they keep you out of harm's way and that's when you're out here things can go south very quickly um, and that's when you will rely on the man or woman stood beside you and a couple of things i would have done differently is as an english client they were speaking afrikaans a lot to one another i would want them to speak english so that not only so the client could understand what was going on the whole time because truth be told i the only reason i really knew what was going on is because of my own experiences i if I had been clueless, I wouldn't literally have known not what animal we were shooting to the very last minute. Also, we were, we were quite far away, for, you know, and whilst clients should be able to shoot, uh, 160 yards is a challenging shot um, off, off, a, off, a, off a shooting sticks. I'm only being pedantic in terms of what I changed, but I thought it was pretty much perfect from start to finish. I would obviously, straight away, almost always in the UK, you get your knife out, Gralloc and, and everything, but here it's quite different. They usually, I mean, you take the stomach out, I suppose, um, which we did. Um, and then other than that, it's, it's then wait for the extraction vehicle. All that meat is, is then sold for, or, or moved on or eaten in camp. It's, you know, it's all used. It's all very much a, a product of, um, of, of the hunt. But they also, the PH will then ask you what you want to do with the, the animal itself in terms of for your, you know, I suppose, trophy. And, and the answer would be, you know, you either have a cape, cape and head mount, or in this sense, I'd probably go for it. I'm going for a skull. Um, purely because, you know, if I have a few animals in a trip, it's going to be very expensive to get them all done and sent home. So skulls tend to, uh, you know, they're still pretty, pretty impressive. And, um, and I think just as, just as effective as, as telling the story and having a, having a, you know, a, a forever memory on your, in your sheep lodge or wherever it may, may stand. And I'm trying to, avoid, I don't know why I'm trying to find myself trying to avoid the word trophy, but it, purely because of how the demonized the, the press seems to have made it. But it is essentially what it is, I suppose. But yeah, I do for time. I find myself trying to avoid it. I don't know why. While they wait for the vehicle, one of the guides spots Springbuck. That wasn't over. Whilst we were waiting for the vehicle, we were sat up in a bush, you know, keeping out of the wind. I was going to say sun, but it was cold wind. It wasn't remotely warm. And the group of Springbok started wandering down towards us, and we thought, no, they won't come over there. And sure enough, they ended up feeding to within 100 yards. And so then we had, a, then we had, you know, the opportunity to get up on the sticks and select the, the best round from that group. Um, as we were doing this, the cruiser then decided to make its appearance to pick up the wildebeest. So the Springbok suddenly realised that they, oh, hang on a minute, and some of them started to move. So then suddenly it was very high pressure, which one, which one, which one, no that's overlapping, no that's overlapping, no that's broadside. I had three opportunities, we're almost with the trigger and it moved until I finally had that we had the right animal in the right place, broadside, uh, and I made a pretty, pretty, pretty effective shot and this one did go down pretty much on the spot. So he, he, he ran a yard, reared up and fell down dead. So, you know, that's um, in the sense that the difference that the you know, Blue Wildebeest probably would have shrugged off and said, stuck two fingers and run off again. But um, no, that was, uh, that, was, that was great. So, and I think we're set to bry, bry the uh, Springbok this evening. So, um, you yeah, know, it's a result all round and uh, two animals on the ground. So, yeah. For more about the Northern Cape Professional Hunting School, go to ncph.co.za. Next up, James Marchington meets a gamekeeper who looks after partridges, pheasants and stone curlews. Here's a conservation success story you won't be seeing on the BBC. Why? Because the hero of the story is a gamekeeper. Tony Lowry is saving rare stone curlews on a shooting estate near Andover in Hampshire, where he works as the keeper. They look almost like a bit bit prehistoric, to be honest. They're a strange-looking bird. They've got big yellow piercing eyes. They're migratory birds. They come in about you know, March time every year uh, and lay a couple of clutches of eggs and go off in October back to Africa where they're reasonably common. It's just in the UK, they're not that common. And we do our best to try and protect them by a, keeping the balance and trying to keep the predators down to an acceptable level so they're not 
being predated, because if you don't, they, the eggs will just disappear, even though they, the stone curlews are pretty good parents. Um, they're not going to fight off a fox or a buzzard or a crow. And when there's agricultural work going on on the ground, we do our best to make sure they're safe. You know, if it, the ground's being drilled or rolled or sprayed or anything, we just lift the chicks or lift the eggs out of the way while the machine goes over them, put them back down again. If we don't protect them, help protect them, then they're, they're going to die out in this country. There's not only stone curlews, there's everything else here. It's a, it's a pretty special part of the country. I spend a lot of my time building bird boxes for all sorts. Little owls, kestrels, barn owls, tawny owls, blue tits. I uh, even put rotted timber up for willow tits because we have those here as well. So, you know, it's, it's all about doing those sort of things. It's not just about the, the game birds, although mm. it is why I'm employed. There are plenty more examples of shooters and gamekeepers doing vital work to save wildlife. Igor Timmerman sent us this drone footage, showing how he saves roe deer fawns that are about to get run over by a forage harvester. The tiny fawn is virtually invisible, even from the air, but it's revealed by the drone's thermal camera, allowing Igor to move in and take it safely out of the way. Once the harvester is finished, he releases the fawn, which he says is quickly reunited with its mother in 100% of cases. He saves between 10 and 15 fawns this way every year, and the local farmers now call him whenever they're planning to cut their grass fields. In Suffolk, farmer and shooter Graham Denny looks after the turtle doves that nest on his ground. My grandfather, when I was a small lad, used to take me out in the yard and said, the doves are home, boy, go and get some roll barley, which we used to feed to the cattle and feed them. Now, a lot of the small farms have gone by the by. There isn't many people throwing free food about. There isn't everybody with chickens in the garden that haven't got a net over the top of them, whereas they used to, years ago, be open and they used to feed the turtle doves, and that's all gone. There might be people with bird feeders that have now got a few of them, but the habitat that they need for nesting has, has dwindled, and uh, it seems to concentrate them a little bit. And so we, you know, as, as, a, as a farm, because we've got them, we, we feed them, look after them, and we protect them, and we protect them from nest predation as well, uh, taking some of the predators out, taking the squirrels and some of the magpies out that would damage their numbers. Meanwhile, back in Hampshire, Tony Lowry is excited that he's just spotted not one, but two stone curly chicks, looking strong and healthy and close to fledging. But even the man from the RSPB, the volunteer that comes out and monitors them, he's not seen two chicks. So what we're seeing today is new to me, and it looks like there were two chicks. <laughs> he wonders whether it's time gamekeepers rebranded themselves to shake off the old stereotypes. I know, I think it's an old-fashioned word, and when I, when I suggest else, else, you know, maybe a different job title on social media and stuff, so I get shot down in flames a lot, but some people it's a good idea, perhaps we should have you know, a different, a different title because gamekeeper. If you don't know gamekeeping, sums up a sort of Seth Armstrong type thing in people's minds. And uh, those old enough to remember Seth Armstrong. Um, so you know, I, I think maybe there should be a change in title. We yes, we are keepers of game, but also you know, for want of a better word, um, and everybody says it, custodian in the countryside and things like that. You know, so wildlife ranger maybe. You know, will be a better title. Yeah, it, it's a difficult one. Thanks to Tony and all who contributed to that piece. And remember that we can make stories like that thanks to our supporters in the Field Sports Nation, who this week are watching their own Tuesday night show, Field Sports Extra, where they can win a Wooks custom rifle stock priced at more than £500. You can join them. Follow the link to the Field Sports Nation in the description below. Perhaps someone will buy their father a Field Sports Nation membership as a generous Father's Day present. Who knows? Incidentally, the British Shooting Show is promoting tickets to their 2023 event at Birmingham's NEC as another Father's Day gift. Visit bit.ly slash BSS2023. You can pop across to our shop for more gift ideas, fieldsports.shop. And if you want to buy a Wooks custom rifle stock, visit bit.ly slash Wooks store. Next, from Stone Curlews to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the top hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Clark Boys Hunting New Zealand have a heart-stopping close encounter with a rutting stag in thick cover before heading for the tops and dropping this one on the open hill. 
Vernon Control Scotland is farmyard ratting with his Theoban Rapid Mark 1 air rifle fitted with an Eagle Vision GoPro adapter, producing some top quality shots. Pedro Ampuero is after Cantabrian chamois in the mountains of northern Spain with his Mexican friends. They miss one, but keep going in the hope of another chance. Hakan from Cyprus offers a brutal compilation of crows and magpies attacking eggs, nestlings, and even full-grown pigeons to explain the importance of controlling corvids. Thanks to Brian Slater for sending that one in. Current British Open sporting clay champion Brody Woolard is in the hot seat in the latest video in the Jack Pike Spot Shot series. Alex Sayer visits the Basque Have A Go clay lines at the Highclere Country Show in her latest roundup of news from the world of shooting. Vinnie Jones visits the stalking show, then heads to the rifle range for a fun competition with his mates in this video from the Crafty Countryman channel. And finally, Desert Dog takes a deep dive into the ethics of long-distance hunting and wonders if some of the big hunting channels have lost their moral compass. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. Click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, about 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.